Hello and welcome to another English podcast with with Paul. I'm your host, Paul. So, as always, natural native English conversation. Normally I just ramble on about some topic that I think is interesting and I say it as a natural and at a regular speed. I might chuck in a couple of interesting words. So, okay, what are we talking about today? Culture shock. All right. Asia cultural shock. Some of you may know that I've been to Cambodia and I always say two years, but I get told off. It's, it's two con non-consecutive years because we, we went for a year uh, in Phnom Penh in the capital city. And then we came back again for um, for, for family reasons and to, to see people we wanted to see. Got a little bit homesick and felt like we'd done, done a whole year. In, in Phnom Penh, the capital city. And then after Brexit and um, the pandemic, we went back again, but to, to Siem Reap, the, uh, the second biggest city. And it was much, much different, much different sort of attitude and much different sort of um, ambiance and feeling. So, so we went back again for another year and we, and we stayed just over a year. Um, so yeah, that two non-consecutive years, that we spent in Cambodia and learning their language and, you know, having our own apartments and working and really get connected and, and um, understanding the the uh, the country and, and the people, you know, really getting connected and involved. So I wanted to talk about culture shock because I've experienced it firsthand. When you first think of culture shock, or when, sorry, when I first thought of culture shock, I thought, ah, it's just people are being pansies, people are being soft and a bit soppy and silly, you know? I'm a strong kind of guy, strong-willed person, you know? Strong mind. But actually, you're, what, what culture shock is generally is, is a lot of stimulation and a lot of change and a little bit confusing of, of trying to understand what's happening and what's going on around you. So for me, I would say, uh, and this is quite common, I would say that it, it takes a few months, some, sometimes two or three months for the culture shock to, to really kick in and, and hit home with you, you know, in your head, in your person. Because a lot of it is excitement and honeymoon period. And just enjoying all the great, crazy, new, different, bizarre, unusual, strange things going on all around you. And that you're getting used to. All right. So you're you're really willing and, and uh, wanting to have these experiences to start with. But after a while, after maybe a month, so for some people it's a lot less. For some people it's just a couple of days. But for me, maybe, maybe it was a month uh, or more that I really noticed culture shock and and what is culture shock to me culture shock is the you accept and you see lots of bizarre unusual weird strange things but it actually it's a bit like it's a bit like an accident you know where when you're in a trauma a traumatic experience you know, when something happens that first of all, you get up and everything's fine and everything's great. And, and then slowly it sinks in, you know, like, like like if you almost got into a fight when somebody started to, to be very aggressive towards you and you build up all that adrenaline and, and and you deal with that situation. But maybe a few hours later, then, you know, the adrenaline has gone. You start thinking, oh, my God, that was that that was that was really hard to handle and difficult and, and traumatic and upsetting. So so for me, I would say over a month went by because I'm this this strong, rugged, manly kind of guy, you know, with this with this strong attitude. That over a month went by that I thought, oh, oh, my, oh, 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 oh I don't know how to cope with, with this this madness, this constant madness. Because when you go to a completely different culture and then from the Western society over to the Eastern society, Eastern society, it is a very big change. There's a lot of difference. We, we forget just how ingrained and normal everything is in the West and, and just in our own country. 
like, I don't know, maybe you go to Europe, but a lot of things are still very, very similar. You, you don't realize how similar Europe is to, say, America or the United Kingdom. You know, you don't quite realize how similar those countries are. You know, you might, for example, a coffee, uh, coffee in Starbucks or a McDonald's is almost identical. You could go to, you could go to Amsterdam and have a, uh, a McDonald's or a Starbucks or, or something else, I don't know, KFC. But when you go to Asia, firstly, in Cambodia, there is no McDonald's, not anywhere in the country. So, and we did, we did find a KFC, not, not that I eat chicken, but we did find a KFC and it's served with rice, not fries. And there's just a lot of things that are completely and utterly different. Now, I don't want to get people squirmish too upset, but for example, the toilets, you might be in, say, Amsterdam, or you might be in France, or you might be in some other European country, and you go to the bathroom, the water closet, the toilet, the loo, whatever you want to call it, and you, you go in and you see some cubicles or urinals, and then you go in the cubicle and shut the door and turn around and you sit down on a, on a relatively clean seat that you know, some places not that clean, but you know, you, you could wipe it off with some tissue and then you push the button or in the olden days, we would have pulled the flush and I have pulled the flush in, in many a toilets. And, and that is kind of normal for everybody in Europe. But if you go to Asia and especially on the outskirts and the smaller, smaller villages and towns, um, it, it's not like that at all. It's either just a hole in the ground or you might have a porcelain square tile with ridges for your feet to go on or your flip-flops to go on and then a hole in the middle and to the side there may be a, a ladle or, or a bucket or, or some small container and a big bucket of water to flush your, you flush it down yourself so if you've been for a P, you've got to aim it right down. If you're going for a number two and you're, you've literally got to squat, I mean, we Westerners generally aren't used to squatting and for, for any length of time, it, especially if, if there's nothing to hold on to. You know, just naturally squatting is a bit difficult at, at my age. I mean, I've, I've been practicing and, and uh, want to keep my mobility. So... Hence, one of the reasons why I went to Asia was to make myself squat. But to, to, be, to be going to the toilet and squatting and understanding the levels of hygiene is very different. So, for example, it may be just a, a hole in the ground and mud around it. There may be open gaps all around the bottom of the toilet and the top of the toilet. It might be just a tiny little door, you know, for privacy. And often it's maybe maybe because it rains less in Asia or less heavy or and also because it's less cold and less chilly in Asia, there there's a lot more open buildings. And, and what I mean by that is there's a lot less insulation and, and, and covering all the gaps in, in Asia quite often. Like I say, there, there's a big gap underneath, there's a big gap on top. And another problem that causes is mosquitoes and other um, insects. I mean, we've been in some bathrooms where we've just walked out and thought, no, we'll, we'll hold it till we get home. And that's not just because it was disgusting, you know, because not everybody aims as well. Maybe children that have been in there or, or um, another Westerner that wasn't uh, very well may have been in there. So it's not just the cleansiness. Uh, on the insects and the complete openness of it with just probably just a few sides around you might have a top you know a roof if you're lucky um, and then trying to see if there's there's you looking around to see what you're flushing away with sometimes there is a flush sometimes there is a toilet a proper toilet and you're very grateful for that but then when you come out 
there's there's no sink. There was well, there's no sink in the cubicle, and then you come out into the open with everybody else, and the the hand washing facilities may be very very limited. In fact, in in most parts of Cambodia, I think up until COVID, um, really took over, and and the government really really pushed educating of washing hands. Before that. There, there was very, very little hand washing going on at all. It's just one of those things that, that hasn't, hasn't filtered down in regards to the education of, of uh, washing your hands. So, so that's very bizarre, very unusual. Um, and I don't quite... Let me just bring it a little bit closer. And I don't quite know how, how people have stayed healthy for so long. Well, in fact, I think they haven't. There's, there's always been talks of um, dysentery. I think that's the right word. Dysentery and other illnesses for, for people living in, in um, Asian countries. There, there's the, I mean, for example, there's that famous saying that, that we say in the West when you go and traveling. Uh, and that Delhi belly. Belly as in your stomach and Delhi being um, uh, a city in... in um, in India. And that means just to everybody that, that you're probably going to have diarrhea and maybe sickness and diarrhea. Obviously, not obviously, um, is f quite famous from a lot of films, even Top Gear, BBC TV. The, the presenters often get deli belly or, or ill when they go into foreign countries, not just because of lack of hand washing. But because as a whole, there's a lot more germs around. And I think, personally, it's just my opinion, I think that's one big reason why hot and spicy food is so much more prevalent in these countries. And that is to um, kill off some of the bacteria. But e even the children have it. Even the children have a lot of um, belly aches until, until they get into adulthood as their, their stomach is growing and their bodies are growing, I guess. But then that's the same with mosquitoes. That's another story. So yeah, deli belly, upset stomach. That is quite quite common apparently in, in Asia. Uh, even even with the locals, especially the younger the younger children. So th that's one thing about culture shock. Like I said, the, the the bathrooms, the toilet situation. Now me being a man, my my standards are fairly low anyway. Maybe as I get older, my standards are getting higher, but. As a man, I, th I thought there was a lot of places that, that could really do with some hygiene standards, you know, like, like tiles on the wall and, and then maybe a regular program of washing it down once a month would definitely be an improvement, would be a start. So, yeah, it's, uh, that, that, that's one of the things. All right, culture shock. So, yeah, the, the toilets. Let's have a little quick look here. I mean, I've got um, Let's have a look over here. I've got a, a page up here and it just looks at some of the other things that I talked about culture shock just to give me a reminder. I've also got a lot of notes so you may see me looking down. So poverty, yeah, poverty was a big issue. You see it in a lot of places. It's, it's around you all the time, which is almost like very different, very different because it's almost almost like the wealthy and the have and the have nots are quite comfortable where they are in life the kind of i've got all this and you've got that that's you this is me and that's it where where in the west you have to normally search out for poverty or you have to be looking for it specifically you may see a homeless person on the street here and there or maybe a bunch of them gathered in one corner uh, but generally you don't see that much poverty in the uk unless you're looking for it but in asia i i've seen I've seen children in, in like rags, dirty rags and, and looking dirty and, and hungry, you know, and begging, coming up to the tables. And, and that's another thing. In, in the UK, most restaurant, restaurant owners wouldn't want people coming in and, and harassing. Maybe that's a bit harsh, not harassing, but asking the customers for money because that would intimidate the customers and the, and the customers, us in the West, are are more reserved and um, have a lot more guilt we put on ourselves 
uh, and so we wouldn't be allowed into uh, an establishment if we were um, looking disheveled and 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 and, and poverty stricken. But in Asia, it's perfectly fine. They they let in, uh, well not let in. They don't stop anybody from coming in, whether they're asking to sell something. They they could be selling food whilst you're in a restaurant eating food. Which you'd think the owner would say that's a conflict of interest, and so would stop that. But but no, you you can take your food. Sorry, the, uh, a local person could take their food and try and sell it in a restaurant to the tourists eating in that restaurant. Not always the case everywhere, but from from what I've seen. So that that's poverty is is everywhere in Asia. <laughs> Yeah, it is very prolific. You can see it in a lot of places. You don't have to shy away from it. It's it's very abundant. And along with that, and, and what somebody has written on here uh, on the website was about trash or litter. There's a lot of litter. Sometimes it'll be swept up and put into an area. Maybe in the city, it's, it's swept up and it's taken out to a landfill. But often, just outside the city or just in the corners, you'll see there's piles of it piles of it not just bottles plastic bottles which sometimes are recycled but often you'll see somebody burning their litter because you can't pay for the rubbish man to come and collect it obviously big businesses do but generally most people small businesses don't pay for anybody to come and take away their litter so it's just either chucked in the street or chucked in maybe a couple properties down. There may be um, an empty plot, which might just be a square of, of, uh, of grass or mud. It might even be filled up with water. It just gets dumped in there or dumped anywhere else. It, it's just dumped anywhere. So, so poverty and litter are, are um, prevalent in, in Asia, especially, especially in Cambodia. I saw just as much of it in, in uh, Vietnam as well. I, I only lived in Vietnam for for a month or two, but uh, we we yeah we moved on to Cambodia pretty quick. Right. Okay. So talking about the poverty, and also the humidity. When you get off the plane, you're like, whew, like like it's like walking into a sauna. It's super hot straight away, and within ten minutes you're sweating and thinking, oh, I got to start taking layers off. This is too much, too hot, too much. <coughs> Excuse me. So. The, the humidity, constant sweating, oh, an airplane just went over. Constant sweating, humidity, takes a while to get used to. And depending on that temperature, you may not ever get used to it. We, we found ourselves just stop moaning about it after a couple of months. You know, and you see new people coming in, you know, saying how odd it is. And you say, yeah, it, it doesn't change. You just stop moaning about it and talk about other things eventually. But that, that's a big thing, the humidity really hits you. And, and then that humidity, like if you're in the sauna, it slows you down. You might wake up in the morning, right, yeah, I'm going to get this done and this done and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And, but after you've like got up and got dressed and had a shower, within 20 minutes you're worn out again. And, and especially Cambodia, people don't walk anywhere, especially Westerners, tourists, don't walk anywhere because it's so hot. You walk down the road half a mile, you're exhausted. Whew. So often you'll see tourist Westerners on bicycles to get a little bit of draft, but generally um, it is considered odd and bizarre. And so you're expected to take a tuk-tuk or a pass up, you know, a rickshaw. So, so that helps keep you cool and help you keep you going for longer. But you do get tired in Cambodia and you can see why some of the older locals are walking around without their tops on and, and why often people are napping. People nap a lot in Cambodia, especially um, when they're not working. All right, so humidity, dust and arid. Yeah, so, so it's very, very dusty. And then obviously when it rains, it's very, very muddy because I think it's very difficult to grow um, trees and shrubs and plants and stuff in, in Cambodia in the general, in general. In Siem Reap, where we were, especially on the outskirts where there's plots of land, some of the locals would actually have garden centers where they would grow lots of different shrubs 
and plants and they would obviously constantly water it and, and keep it replenished and keep it going but that that is more of a middle class thing that, that's happening now plants and shrubs and dogs and cats uh, that's selling quite well in Cambodia at the moment so we've got poverty we've got aridness bureaucracy bureaucracy oh my goodness so I don't know if you followed anything of, of mine but if you have a look on my Instagram you'll you'll see um, on second class hobos you'll see that I bought a motorcycle I I didn't want to be renting one and I didn't want to be beholden to pass apps you know because sometimes it's hard to find one whether it's late at night or early in the morning it can be difficult to find one then you've got that haggle so sometimes it's a hassle you know because you've constantly got the pay and you might want to spend the whole day out somewhere so a little bit of flexibility and freedom actually owning a motorcycle for me was a, was a good idea i i did a bit of research and found that um if it's under 125 cc then you don't need to have uh, a local test or, or, or exam or license you can just jump on it and ride you should really have insurance as a westerner but that's another story we'll come on to that so having this motorcycle the, the one i bought had no number plate and and i was told that i would get pulled over and fine so i had to get a number plate and my my tuk tuk driver or or the tuk tuk driver that befriended me because obviously i i used him a lot took me out to the local police station, helped me register it. We had to get like three or four forms. We had to go back the, a week later and then we had to give some other identification. Um, and then we had to go back again to get the number plate. So it took, it took probably three weeks to, to get this number plate sorted out. And then I, I pay for photocopying, I pay for the license, I had to get my photos done. Uh, what else was there? Um, and the actual metal number plate itself, which was like two dollars, and then the photocopying was only like a, less than a dollar. So, yeah, there is a bit of bureaucracy, and that's just for the motorcycle. D don't get me uh, started with thinking about and talking about um, the business owners that I met and talked to out there. And we'll come on to something about that again later on. Okay. Um, hierarchy within the family and and also the same with government but hierarchy within the family and that family unit is very very different it seems quite unusual to to uh well for me it seems quite unusual to to see that those that are um higher up within the family within the patriarchal system i don't i don't know if that's the right term patriarch patriarchal system so like the the father is the top and, and, and then the mother and then the eldest sibling and then the uh, you know and then the, the female siblings um, and all the way down to the you know the lower to the smaller children uh, and somewhere in that grandma would be as well grandma would be in there somewhere as well so yeah it's it's interesting that that they still have this patriarchal system uh, and I spoke to somebody who had a girlfriend that was I don't want to say a lady of the night but definitely somebody that worked in the clubs and the bars and got paid for extracurricular activities, shall we say. Although, no, I'll leave it at that. And they said often they would be disowned by their families or, or, or really disrespected and, and turned down by the family and, and really sort of really not liked at all. Even though the, the family, the father or the brother would take the money that they, they'd earned. So my friend said the best thing to do for a lady like that is to give her experiences, give her opportunities to do things and go places. But if you buy her possessions like, like jewellery or, or handbags or clothes, it'll probably get taken off of her and sold. And I was like, wow, wow. So unfortunately, the, the um, gender roles and... and uh, I don't know that the family hierarchy is still quite a big thing in Asia, and then we'll, we'll get onto a bit more again in a minute about when I said about the government politeness. Yes, yes, the people are so polite, always bowing, always offering to help, and often you'd see lots of staff. You know, maybe they'll be following you around, not not because they think you're stealing anything, but because they want to help. They want to be the ones. Often they're bored because there's more staff than there are customers. I've been in a shop 
often and there's only been only me or um, you know me and one other and then there, there's lots of staff some of them are playing on their phones but they're very very helpful most of them understand you know a good bit of English e even in CM Reap the young the younger staff um, were often not bad at English you know maybe to the level of a a six or seven year old English level but that, that's the youngsters the older the older generation less so but but there's a another reason for that altogether okay so what were you we saying politeness yeah everybody seems really polite often you'll get offered food um, and and good hospitality generally all in all very good very polite okay what else we got them yeah so I said about staffing over staffing lots and lots of staff the wages in in Asia especially in Cambodia are very very low so a security guard uh, and, and maybe even a policeman uh, is generally on around 150 to 200 dollars a, a month now 200 dollars a month is pretty low and then but you you can get a small place to live for 50 dollars a month which is basically water and electric and a roof almost like a garage with no floor it's very very basic so that, that's 50 dollars a month my apartment the my last apartment was a block of three or four and obviously I had internet good in well, average internet um, water that you can't drink electric and the electric was charged extra so so for my Wi-Fi and electric and rent I paid a hundred and fifty dollars a month so obviously Western standards that's very very cheap but Khmer standards that's a little bit expensive now there is a lot of property and premises that's a lot more expensive than that. You can be in a high rise with a gym and a swimming pool and all these all these amenities. And almost all of these places have a, a security guard. The place I was at was only three, four stories and only four apartments. So there was no security guard, but it, it was off the beaten track, so to speak. Mm, so wages are very, very low. All right, traffic system. Oh my goodness. Oh, right. So, <laughs> in in Phnom Penh, you you may see some images and video on uh, on YouTube. But in Phnom Penh, the capital city, you might think at first that it's just chaotic and madness and and crazy movement of of motorcycles and and a few cars and bicycles, just manic it, it, it seems to have no rhyme or reason but if you plow through and you continue to 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 um, ride your motorcycle or, or drive your car you get to learn that it's swarm mentality coming into a round very few traffic lights and even then they're they're not keen on understanding the traffic lights they, they kind of want to go so at a roundabout, it's swarm mentality. If you arrive there on your own, uh, and then fewer, more and more and more and more and more motorcycles and cars and, and buses all congregate around you, ready to go across the road, across the junction. And all the vehicles to the perpendicular, to the side of you, will, will uh, dwindle down and get lesser, especially as your group tends to move forward and, and gently, gently, gently push in uh, against the other lot of traffic on, on the other side. And they will generally slow down and give way. And then your lot of um, traffic and movement and group will, will just go and go and go. And then the same happens again. So, so it's almost like a, a bubble of water getting bigger. And then that goes. And then the other side. And then once that's dwindled down, then the other side will go. And they will have built up. So it's quite it's quite interesting, yeah. But generally at intersections where there's not a lot happening or not a lot of people, people will just slow down and they'll they'll look left and right and then they'll just carry on going. So in general, I would say the traffic is very slow in Cambodia, around fifteen to twenty miles an hour. Sometimes a little bit faster on the bigger roads, but not a lot. And it's supposed to be that the priority is with the the most vulnerable individual. So, so the walker has the 
uh, has priority and then the cyclist and then the person on the scooter and then the person in the car and then the person in the lorry. Now that's the, the gist of how it's supposed to work. Not always 100% like that. And I think the, the, the most upsetting thing is, uh, is traffic accidents because rarely do you see a traffic accident but occasionally it will happen and often it's a young person with all their courageousness and and um, rebelliousness and energy and excitement will will be two or three of them on a scooter belting down and they'll come a cropper against either somebody bigger or or their tires will be bold and they'll all slip off and, and and I noticed it was very common that people had scars uh, on their legs and knees and hips from from having accidents uh, many times probably in bad weather so the scooter scooter drivers scooter riders tend to be quite good I've seen children as small as 10 on the front of a motorcycle driving it in charge of it riding it and then one or two people behind often you'll see three or four people on a on a scooter and like I say often they're, they're um, quite young as well so that's a bit scary to start with and then and then you get the gist of it and the hang of it and you just go slow but going back to what I was saying earlier, something I was going to come back to is, is now I know I might get some slack from this, but corruption. So the corruption is, is very prevalent in poor countries because obviously people are desperate and it stems from the bottom all the way to the top. So if you have a dispute with your neighbor or if you're having a dispute with um, somebody else over money and, and maybe a big issue, probably land dispute, then it normally gets taken up with uh, the police or, or a local official. And it generally, whoever's got the most money and the most connection wins. And I saw this firsthand with, with my landlord talking to the other neighbours that, that do not like him because, because he had more influence and more money than they did. So he, he wins generally and that, that level of maybe not corruption maybe we could say the word um, hierarchy comes into force and, and that's that's very similar as well in in lots of different aspects lots of different areas so like I said on the motorcycle um, and and sometimes in in transport and driving but also also with um, if you have an accident and you got a white face and you look like a tourist, somebody will probably point at you because they want the money and they think, oh, tourist, he's got a lot of money. He did it, his fault. So if you're ever uh, on a, in an accident, go away quickly. Now I know this is really against what we're used to and what we know, but I'm serious. If there's an accident, Get away from that scene as quickly as possible because you will be implicated and they will try to force you to pay two, three, four thousand, five thousand uh, dollars and maybe more. So I know it sounds wrong, but get out of there as quick as possible. Disappear. Not from the town, but from, from the vicinity. Okay, so yeah, corruption because there's such poverty and desperate people. You have a white face, you're, you're, you're a valuable person, you've got lots of money. That, that's the way they see it there. And that seems fair to them. A lot of them are quite happy to vin indicate, vindicate, indicate, vindicate uh, a person with money, a tourist. Because, you know, you've got money, I haven't. And I think maybe they feel it's a little bit unjust or, or you can afford it. You can afford to pay me a few thousand. So... Unfortunately, that's the way it is, and that's how it's always been. And I, I think that's quite prevalent throughout Asia from the stories I've heard in, in other Asian countries. So that's, that's one of the downsides. Also, education is very poor. Now, education, uh, I've talked about it on another channel, and another time, another video, sorry. Education is key for the individuals, especially the youngsters, to get out of poverty. Because if you can speak English, you can speak good English, you can get a good job. Jobs are, are the way they get money, whether it's through tourism or, or backhanded way through tourism. Being able to speak English really does open up 
uh, a lot of opportunities for them. Travel is not, not often a big opportunity. They often have to stay within their country because a passport is very expensive. And only those that, are, that need and deserve a passport get given a passport. So again, a hierarchy of who's, uh, who's more important. So education. The education system, again, very, very poor. A lot of people, well, almost, almost everybody, try to, to pay to get their child into, into private school. So the state run a school where, where the uniform and, and they do multiple subjects. But often, it, it, even if you've got a photocopying shop or a sweet shop or, or some kind of shop, they try to save enough money to send the children to the afternoon or the morning of um, an academic, an English academia, English academic classes, because they know the, the, the necessity for them to learn English. So, so that happens a lot. Even, even if the people are very poor, they do try and send their children to, to English classes, which is a, another issue altogether, isn't it? So learning English really makes a big difference for, for um, the young people's future. English is also a systemic problem through the older generations, like I was saying about the traffic and traffic lights. Traffic lights are, for example, if you come to traffic lights in Cambodia, often if, it's, if you're going right, bear in mind it's like America, that they drive on the, the right-hand side of the road. So if they're turning right, they'll go anyway. On, on a red light, they'll still go right, and they don't see that as a problem. Now, you're supposed to drive on the right, but a lot of times there's like a, a dual carriageway or, or something down the middle. And if you need to get to the other side, often they'll go on the wrong side of the road in a smaller lane, almost like a cycle lane where, where you'll often see cyclists or, or you might even see an oxen pulling a, um, a tract or even sometimes like, a, um, ah, what's the word, a cultivator, like, like a garden machinery, you know, with the big wheels at the back and small wheels at the front that, that would be like a, a diesel plow. You often see them pulling a trailer. And, and there be like could be lots of people in the trailer, could be a huge, great, big wooden building on the back of the trailer being pulled along by this rotavator. So I'm going off topic a little bit. Education throughout is is uh, is systemic. So I obviously I've talked to a lot of expats. I've I've met a lot of expats. I used to play frisbee in uh, in in Cambodia, ultimate frisbee, and and that's where you meet a lot of expats as well as as well as other activities and things that happen and you get to see them in the same cafe the same restaurants time and time again so talking to these other expats you find out that you know some of some of these other expats well my friends uh work in restaurants and and they're europeans that they and they've said that it's, it's very frustrating that they they may show a cambodian um manager or or, or or member of staff a quicker better easier more efficient way of doing something in, in the in the um, hotel or, or catering industry, but the, the the management and everybody else will refuse that. They'll they'll deny that. They'll do it their own way. So, for example, if if you um, I don't know, showed them how to wash their hands properly, they would go no 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 we we do it this way, or so that that can be very very frustrating. My my friends say when you try to show them an easier way, and and like I said before it's overstaffed there's too many staff so there's not the efficiency of cogs in a wheel and a, and a good team because often uh, uh, a member of staff a, a, a local person would uh, would not like stress if it's stressful and busy and fast and hard they'll leave and and maybe that's because Cambodia is very very hot and so very gentle very low paid, very easy work is preferable. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Westerners work harder. Maybe it's to do with the, the humidity. It, it could be a situation like that. But education is very slowly seeping into the older generations. And for, for reasons, if you want to look into with the the sad history of Cambodia uh, and, and um, people wearing glasses and intellectuals uh, in the past. Most of those have been killed off and uh, yeah, yeah, look into their history. 
So if you wear glasses, that, that often I found in the classroom teaching students uh, would, would very rarely see people wearing glasses. And that's because often the grandparents would be paying and the grandparents remember the time where if you wore glasses in the 80s, 90s, you, you could have been killed um, by the Khmer Rouge or, um, or, or, or deemed to be intelligent and, and that would really go against you and, and you could get in trouble for that. But there's a, a whole new, a whole other video about Cambodia's history. All right, so education, it's slowly seeping down. It is getting better. But um, yeah, learning about the education systemically throughout comes with a lot of pride as well, a lot of pride. All right. So pride and education is slowing down some of the some of the some of the messages and lessons that that more developed countries are trying to share with with, uh, with Asia. I, I find that Cambodian people are more likely to listen to other Asians. So, for example, Filipinos or Chinese people are more like they're more likely to, to get through because I don't know, maybe because they're Asian, maybe because they're they're of a similar wavelength, a similar culture. I don't know. Humili uh, so education, humility, pride, all these things have a real big impact on, on the education of the, the country as a whole. But things are changing. Things are slowly, slowly changing. There's such as the APTA, Asian Pacific Trade Agreement. Originally, the Bangkok Agreement, signed in 1975, is being rejuvenated to, to bring together um, other economic countries to, to have, um, what they call it, like unilateral trade, a lot easier and, and a lot less, lot less uh, bureaucracy in, in trade. Um, but the young people are becoming slowly more educated with the likes of YouTube and movies and podcasts and, and, and just being exposed to the rest of the world. There's a lot of young people that, that really want to embrace Western culture. OK, uh, what else we got? So also, and going back to another positive, is the um, teenagers, and especially the young girls, are quite reserved and respectful your average young girl is not flaunting her body or herself in any way and the guys are, are pretty innocent as well i don't know if i'm being naive but there there doesn't seem to be a lot of sexual connotations with music or dancing or just hanging out and hanging around with one another it seems to be very calm and relaxed. I think there's a very traditional sense of how things should go, and unless you're working in a bar, and in which case it, it could be a case of you're a little bit more flirtatious, but definitely dressed appropriately. So that's very different as well. And teenager attitudes are very, very polite and respectful. Even, even in like alleyways, we never felt um, unsafe at all. So, so bizarre that, you know, you might see a, a group of teenagers coming towards you. First thing you, you think about in the West is, right, you know, am I safe? Am I good? Am I, have I got my wallet and my watch and, and stuff? And, but, but in Asia, no, the, the, the teenagers are very, very respectful, which, which felt a bit awkward. Crime is very, very low. Um, I didn't see any crime, really. The only crime might be that, that you'd get overcharged for something. But generally, that's not a problem. Um, infrastructure is slowly coming in. China is investing and other countries are investing in, in um, Cambodia. So infrastructure is slowly coming. The electricity, there's a lot of blackouts. Uh, normally, in, in the city, it would only be for sort of up to 30 minutes, maybe an hour. The further out you go, the longer the blackouts are. Uh, I know out in the, the sticks, maybe a couple miles out, a few miles out, uh, it could be a half a day where you've got no electricity, which also means no Wi-Fi if you're using the household Wi-Fi and not your mobile phone. But on the flip side to that, mobile phone technology is really coming on leaps and bounds there. They, they recommend you have two or three, two different SIMs 
you know, you can get electronic SIM in most phones now, uh, two different providers. So you've always got good signal wherever you are in the country. And, and it's very cheap. I think I think I paid something like seven euros for for like, um, I think it was like 50 gigabytes of data, which, which was plenty for me anyway. 50 gigabytes of data for seven euros. It was super cheap. Uh, and that was kind of the standard. So, so they're loving the, the TikTok, Instagram kind of lifestyle. Definitely, definitely TikTok. Uh, what else we're we talking about? So family, uh, knock on effect. Crime is very low. Infrastructure. Trains and buses. So in, in Phnom Penh, there's just a train to the, the airport that, that was there when we, I was there. <coughs> just opening up. Buses. There, there are a few buses and they're connecting the big cities. But the roads are very, very bad and, and poor condition. So what would normally be, say, a four hour drive in, in Cambodia is more likely to be six or seven hours on a coach. Hence why people get the night buses or which I wouldn't do. I wouldn't get a night bus. Um, so trains are very, very uh, well, there, there's only one train I've seen buses. Again, the best option for getting around the, and I say buses, I mean coaches, um, and the roads are very, very bad. Health and safety, health and safety. So as I was saying, I wouldn't get a night bus because the health and safety uh, and the, the policing and regulations of health and safety is almost non-existent. So, for example, you could have a, a driver that could have been busy all day and then taking lots of shots and Red Bull and maybe any of the other drugs, I don't know, it could be on all sorts. And, and there's more likely to be an accident at night. And there, there are occasional bus crashes. Occasional. So I always put my seatbelt on and I always go during the day. So that, that's what we do um, for, for maximum safety. Because there have been bus crashes. And you will see lorries and buses along, strewn along the side of the road occasionally. And that just makes you remember. So crime is very, very low. But health and safety... Uh, crime. What am I talking about? Health and safety is is very very absent. Gas. So in a lot of homes, my, for example, my apartment, gas came in a big bottle and then it was plugged up to like a a twin hob, almost like a camping hob. Uh, and I've I've also seen the small hobs for for one camping stove with the refuelable gas gas bottle. Sorry, changeable gas canister. Now in the UK. Excuse me. In UK, they are one-time use. You can use them once, and then they get recycled or, or thrown away or whatever. But in in Cambodia, they could have been used a thousand times. Now, a person at the side of the road would be refilling it from a big gas bowl and a pipe with a regulator, just sat out on their own. Could be a young teenager sat there filling them up and then selling them for a dollar or whatever it is. I can't I can't remember. Not a lot. I think it might have been seventy-five cents. But you got to bring back another one. So we, <laughs> the 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 whole year we were there, we probably had six or seven canisters that that just caught fire and like woo, 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 put that out, put that out, throw that one away. That one's no good. And then you just get out the next one. So a few times, none of them have exploded on us, but we have had uh, a number of them that that catch on fire, and that's because they've been used a thousand times or more. Uh, and they're supposed to be one use only. <laughs> there you go. That's that's Asia for you. That's Cambodia for you. Health and safety doesn't exist. Now, I know somebody that, that um, got caught on fire because they were driving past on a motorcycle uh, and they turned around just as it exploded. Uh, and that was one of these, these people with a big gas bottle filling up little gas canisters on the side of the road. And they were sort of stuck in the middle. They got caught on fire. Very nasty situation. Often you'll hear of petrol stations blowing up as well because there's no health and safety. It is slowly dribbling in. So health and safety. <laughs> I put on one of my videos a picture of um, safety first. And then and then sometimes, well, mo a lot of the time, especially in the sticks, the scaffolding around a building is just bamboo tied up. And the, and the, uh, the workers, the builders, will be walking around in flip-flops. Nobody has safety boots. Nobody has a hard hat. All right. So although they say safety first, it, it, they don't know what that means. It, it doesn't mean anything to them. It's like telling your dog to say please and thank you. Anyway, 
But it is slowly coming in, it's slowly getting better. The education is slowly seeping into society. They're starting to learn a lot more. So, so that, that's what I was going to say about that. Right, going back to what it says up here. What does it say up here? Um, gender, I talked about gender. Uh, health and safety, we talked about that. Um, moving companies. All right, okay. So, as I was said originally about the, the uh, culture shock, it, it is all these things combined that, that eventually gets into your head and you realise all these differences between Western Europe and, and, and Asia when you're there. All these things that, that you, you eventually realise that, that these things are normal in your everyday life, normal in, in the whole of Europe and, and Australia and Canada and America. These things are normal, you know? You, you wear gloves, you wear safety boots, you wear a safety helmet. There's, there's legislation, regulations, there's policing for all these activities that you might do that could cause harm or risk. All these things around you every day are non-existent or, or very, very little in Asia. And that eventually seeps into your brain and you think, hmm, a lot of the locals have, have got injured and have scars and, and you know, you hear of somebody dying and this happens and that happens. And you come to realise that if you live in one of these poverty countries, uh, you need to have, one, really good insurance, which is difficult at my age, it becomes very expensive. And two, the, the likelihood is that it's a risk. The longer you're out in, in, a, in a, um, a country with very poor infrastructure and very poor education and pretty poor hospitals, you come to realise that at some point you are going to be involved in an incident or an accident. There is something that's going to happen to you at some point. And then you have to rely on your friends, your family and the kind heartedness of the locals to scoop you up, maybe quite literally, and get you to a hospital. And then the hospital want to make sure and know that you have got money before they even touch you. So that plays on your mind quite heavily. That and maybe, um, like I said earlier, the, the mosquitoes and the hygiene and the fact that you, you're going to get sick from sickness and diarrhea. This, um, what was the word I used earlier? Anyway, all these things play on, on your mind, like the health and safety, the, 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 um, the sickness, whether or not you want to stay out here for forever and ever and ever. That obviously at some point you're going to get old, you're going to get frail. Maybe you want to try and experience other things. It's a very sort of closed sphere of living in, in some of these Asian countries. Very, very, and all the locals, <coughs> excuse me, are, are, are insular. You know, they, they haven't experienced or seen or know about the rest of the world. So their own little world, their own bubble uh, is, is what they see all the time. And so it's very difficult to explain or discuss or, or, or get excited about other parts of the world, other countries, other things that are available. If, if for example, you and I may be talking about something um, pretty amazing, uh, let, let's just say something with Elon Musk, you know, AI or, or, or robots or Tesla or, or something like that. Many, many people in Asia have no idea, no idea at all oblivious to it because they're in this bubble this their own little bubble of their world and because obviously they're very very poor and it's important that they feed themselves and they look after their business and their family that's that that's a whole world anything outside that doesn't really matter it doesn't really affect their life you and i are excited by ai you and i might be excited by technology and developments and changes and things happening in the world, exciting things. But it, it plays no, no role, no use to your average person in, in Asia. 
uh, especially in Cambodia. So that's another thing that made me think about this culture shock and made me think about my, my future and, you know, where I want to be. And these things, like I said, played on my mind to the point where I, I kind of got a bit nervous and thought, yeah, it's time to go. I, I need to leave now. I need to leave. Something's going to happen. Um, and I, I'm, I'm playing a, a game of odds. So it was time to leave. Um, and yeah, so, so that was the, the, the biggest crux of the culture shock getting used to all, accepting it, and then realizing there's, there's an end in, in mind here because it, it, it's not going to end well eventually. Now, don't get me wrong. People do, Westerners do live in Asia and, and really love it and absorb it and, and stay there for, for the rest of their lives, you know, and that's not normally a very good ending. I've met a couple of elderly people in Asia and they, their plan is just to keep drawing their pension keep getting food brought to them until they can no longer move or no longer help themselves. And that doesn't sound like a very positive, happy way that I would like to leave this world. So, yeah, culture shock. It's, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. And it affects everybody differently. And it, and it can be quite, quite traumatic and difficult to, to get through. But here we are. Here we are. Yes, cultural shock, it's a real thing. It's quite scary, but you get through it and you grow. It makes you grow as a person. You learn a lot more and you've lived, you've enjoyed it and you've got stories to share in the future. But, but you've grown as a person. Okay, that's about it for now. I'm going to wrap it up and thank you very much. I uh, hope to see you again next, next video and I'll see you again soon. I need a cup of tea. And as always, have fun learning, otherwise you're not going to learn. Take care and bye-bye for now.